So we're moving into this area of posterior lateral skull base. We see the jugular foramina lateral to the anterior half of the occipital condyles. Uh, the condyles are anterior lateral to the foramen magnum from 1 to 3 and 9 to 11 o'clock. And you see the jugular fossa on the lower surface of the temporal bone, the sigmoid, the foramen is directed forward under the temporal bone and it's larger on the right side usually. So we move from this area down to the jugular foramen, down to the area along the occipital and lateral condyle. Uh, and in this area, just below and medial to the jugular foramen, we have the jugular tubercle that blocks, if you're lifting cerebellum, blocks access to the front of the brain stem. And here's 12th nerve, and it comes through. This is occipital condyle. It comes through the bone just above the mid portion, if you look at occipital condyle, from back to front, it passes above the mid portion of the occipital condyle. Uh, if you drill off to the side of the condyle, then in this area, you drill paracondyl or you expose the back of the jugular foramen uh, in this paracondyl location so that we're working in this corner of the skull base. And uh, let's see, help us with these muscles uh, on the back of the neck. Uh, what is this? Trapezius, sternocleidomastoid, and this is splenius. Uh, and we call this area between the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius, that's the what triangle of the neck? Posterior triangle. Now we fold with the trapezius downward, the sternocleidomastoids forward, and we're looking at splenius, and this is semispinalis capitis. And we reflect the, the splenius under it, we see what muscle? This is longissimus capitis, and the occipital artery, if you're doing bypasses, can either pass deep or superficial to the longissimus capitis. And then you reflect the semispinalis capitis, and you see the suboccipital triangle. When I first started doing far lateral approaches, or transcondylar, I turned these muscles as individual layers and I found that it was very uh, difficult to close and uh, with a high rate of pseudo meninga seals and wound dehiscence. So we turn all of these muscles down with the scalp flap as a single layer. It's just so much easier to close. These muscles form the border of the suboccipital triangle. So this is superior oblique. It runs from occipital bone to transverse process of C1. A1, this is inferior oblique. It runs from transverse process of C1, the spine of C2, and then from spine of C2 to occipital bone is rectus capitis posterior major.
What muscle is it that runs from occipital bone to C1? And rectus, capitis, posterior, minor. The suboccipital triangle is between these three muscles. <coughs> And the importance of that is the vertebral artery as it passes behind the atlantal condyle is in the depths of this triangle, often embedded in this venous plexus that Sam Malmethy calls the second cavernous sinus. So here we reflected the superior oblique, the inferior oblique, the rectus capitis, and when we reflect those muscles, we see the vertebral artery ascending through the transverse process of C1, usually passing behind the atlantal condyle. But if the arteries are tortuous, this vertebral artery can pass higher behind the occipital condyle or even rest against the occipital bone where it would be very easy to damage it in a retrosigmoid craniotomy. And the artery just before it enters the dura here usually gives off a big posterior meningeal branch that you usually sacrifice but you don't want to confuse this with an extradural origin of the pica that occurs in about 10% of cases. Here we see the atlantal condyle, here below the occipital condyle, and we can open this dura down. For vascular pathology, you can often do a removal of the ipsilateral half of the posterior arch of C1, uh, but for tumor pathology, we often need a wider opening here of the foramen magnum and C2, and in that case, we would use then the horseshoe type of flap and flap that downward. Uh, if you're just dealing with pathology right here, at the dural entrance of an aneurysm arising from the pica, then you don't need a wide laminectomy and you could do a hockey stick incision to complete the far lateral approach. And here we drill supracondylar. We preserve the joint. This is, we drilled off some of the occipital condyle. And here you see the hypoglossal nerve passing above the condyle uh, in a supracondylar approach. If you drill out this condyle, you have access to the lower clivus. And I've used this approach in drilling out chordomas, especially when they've extended into the condyle here. You can get at these in a supracondylar approach. Uh, here we've opened a cup of dura around the vertebral artery so it can be mobilized. We see the hypoglossal nerve and the hypoglossal canal and 9, 10, 11 then entering the jugular foramen above. Over in this area we have jugular foramen uh, here in front of this paracondylar part of the occipital bone. And now, here we mobilize the vertebral, and this is a, what is that? That's an extradural origin of the pica, so you want to be very careful and not include that artery extradurally. Here we've also drilled out paracondylar to expose the back side of the jugular foramen, a posterior approach to the foramen. But this just compares far lateral approach with a transcondylar approach. And you see, even though the condyles are anterolateral, they still can block access to the front of the brain stem. 
and here's the approach drilling out the occipital condyle you see how much further forward that angle is and if you pull this dura backwards you can drill out the condyles and in a transcondylar approach you can actually look across in front of the medulla to the contralateral vertebral artery we're looking under the hypoglossal nerve you can get into the lower clivus and take out cordoma in the lower clivus all the way across to the contralateral hypoglossal canal so this is a route you can take the lower half of clivus without coming through the oral cavity or through the nasal cavity now here we detach the rectus capitis lateralis and have done a paracondylar exposure and here if the pathology locks off the jugular bulb then you can ligate the sigmoid and the internal jugular vein and you can resect this segment of the sigmoid from the back after you mobilize the vertebral artery but this posterior approach will not get you forward to much of the pathology in the jugular foramen that extends forward down the eustachian tube or into the infratemporal fossa and here's just the exposure of the nerve from the back but we see nine ten and this is the eleven here and this is the hypoglossal nerve coming through the hypoglossal canal but you see four nerves join the internal jugular vein and carotid just below the jugular foramen in the upper part of the carotid sheath and arising right here is what nerve what arises from nine here anyone Jacobson's nerve what does J Jacobson's nerve eventually become Jacobson's nerve crosses the promontory and it becomes the what lesser petrosal which ends up going through what ganglion onic and ends up innervating parotid gland now what nerve is this that passes along the anterior wall of the jugular ball the jugular fossa arnold's nerve what does arnold's nerve where does it end up it ends up in the skin around the external canal so you can get an exposure like this from the back 